Not surprisingly, it only took but an hour for the secret to permeate among our group. During the uh, later parts of seminary, I was a part of a group that was uh, studying, practicing, interning, if you will, uh, as chaplains in a, a series of hospitals in Chicago. And it was a, a summer-long 11-week program, probably the hardest 11 weeks of all of seminary. But we are very thankful for this one secret about the hospital, which is kind of our home base. Day surgery had free coffee for the better part of the day. Mochas, cappuccinos, uh, lattes, flavored, ultra-caffeinated, whatever you wanted, it was there. Granted, it may not have been Starbucks coffee, it was day surgery coffee, but there are two truths about the state of a chaplain's body after a 15-hour shift. One, you can't see straight. And two, you don't care that it's not Starbucks. You just need the caffeine. Praise the Lord, we learned about this little secret uh, only two weeks into the 11-week program, so we had a lot of time to be able to enjoy it. And praise the Lord, too, because it was normally the staff chaplains that handled the day surgery. We didn't go in there very often. So the fact that one of our guys could find it was exceptional to us. You go up the, up the stairs, punch in your request, and out came your liquid sustenance. Sometimes it can work out that uh, we wish our prayer life worked the same way. Punch in a request and get a customized answer exactly the way that you want it. But as Jesus taught us to pray, as we look at the Lord's Prayer, it was more than just words. Or more than just words to say in a duty or something like that. But that being said, today's stanza may be not quite so simple as just words to say. Please pray with me. Lord, thank you for all that you give. Thank you for your word. May it feed us today and feed us every day. Amen. Well, I bet if I started you off, you guys could probably quote half of our passage for this morning, from memory even. You don't have to look in your bulletin for this one. Give us this day... Our daily bread, told you. The Exodus passage, what I said, or what we just said, doesn't come from the Exodus passage, but that'll come a little bit later on as an example of looking at this part of the prayer. You okay? I felt that. <laughs> Finally, we get to some of the gimme, gimme, gimme part of this prayer. Or so it may seem. How American in a prayer is that? It's ironic that uh, one of the people that I was reading uh, their article on this particular part of the prayer, they opened up the article by saying, American Christians don't need God. I was like, okay, that's an interesting thing to find in a Christian article. But it's no more apparent than in a prayer for a daily amount of bread. Why pray for that in a culture where Andrew's allowance could cover it? And I'm going to lump all of us in with being the affluent in our world, because compared to our world, let's face it, we are all affluent, rich. But the line says a lot more. That line, give us this day our daily bread. It says a lot more about our relationship with God than it does just a name it and claim it kind of prayer. A gimme, gimme, gimme kind of prayer. Give us this day. Note how it doesn't say give me this day. Not even when I looked at the Greek. I, sorry, if you want a, a loophole there, it's not there. It says give us. Here's where the affluent can still be changed by a prayer like this, a prayer that talking about a meager day's worth of bread. And that it reminds us that for some, 
the next meal and where it's going to come from really is a stressor. You finish up breakfast or your day's worth of food in some parts of the world, maybe even your week's worth of food. And the next thing on your mind is, where am I going to get the next bit? Not just for the sake of hunger, but just for the sake of survival. For a heart that doesn't just race through the words and get through the words and move on to whatever comes next. This part can make this prayer bigger than ourselves. It's ironic that it comes right after the stanza that says, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. How much more bigger than yourselves can you get in a prayer? Perhaps it reminds us of those who are physically hungry, as it's not hard to name parts of the world that, where that is the case and where that next meal, you don't know where it's coming from or how long it's going to be. Maybe it reminds us of those who are spiritually hungry, those who need for survival, really, the bread of life, as Jesus is referred to in John 6. Either way, the more we think, I don't need God for my daily bread, the more we need this prayer to change our lives. Give us this day our daily bread. Not just talking about white or wheat here. Bread, back in the, the people who are originally learning this prayer, bread was kind of a catch-all word, if you will, for survival stuff. Food, shelter, clothing. It was... Provide us with our basic survival needs, as Jesus was saying. Why? I'll take a look at that line right before. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. If we are really called as children of God to participate in kingdom work here on earth, we need to be able to survive. It's hard to think about something as high up Maslow's ladder as kingdom work when we don't know how it is we're going to be able to sustain our bodies. God created us as um, beings with physical needs. And it's fitting that we would pray for them to be met. But it's not an unspiritual request to desire having our body fed so that we can do these things that God calls us to be. To to be that Jesus with skin on that he, he calls us to be. But no, he doesn't say, give us this day our daily prime rib. Give us this day our daily Mercedes, etc., etc., etc. Why should the affluent pray something like this? Well, it crosses culture and time. To know it doesn't take but a heartbeat to lose everything that we have. Just ask Job. A man who certainly defined affluence back in biblical times. Who had hundreds of sheep and oxen and silos going probably all around his property. And yet in a heartbeat, the servants are just lining up to tell him about all the losses. All your animals are dead. All your crops are gone. All your family has been killed. And the hits just keep on coming. In Luke 12, Jesus talks about the parable of the rich fool. The man who had so much grain that he had to tear down his silos so he could build bigger ones to store all of it. I always found that interesting that it would tear down his silos so he could build more. But that's for another sermon. It doesn't take long before, in the parable, this rich fool hears, You fool, this not very night your life will be demanded of you. No matter how full our bread basket may be, you keep close in this. Keep close to this prayer because even in our modern day, maybe some of you have even experienced it, it doesn't take much to lose all that affluence, all that stockpile all that bread basket that we've got. Our daily bread. Again, note what it doesn't say. It doesn't say weekly bread. 
Doesn't say monthly bread, doesn't say a lifetime's worth of bread, but daily bread. Is Jesus saying that we should not be planning for the future? No. I don't think that's the case. There's a certain wisdom in planning for the future. As uh, a couple of weeks ago we were talking about Joseph and how he miraculously ended up in Egypt, second in command, finds out about the famine that's going to hit his homeland, and he starts preparing Egypt for it. And because he prepared for the future, Egypt was able to survive, and his family was able to survive, and all the lineage that comes from his family are able to survive. But the idea is, stay close to God. Count on Him for your daily needs. It's best seen probably in looking at the opposite. We all like nest eggs, security, savings, whatever you know, that looks like for you. Contingency plans. Which is all well and good until we feel safe and secure because of those things. Because I know I've got a good savings account, I feel all right. Like we said earlier, it only takes but a heartbeat for all that to go away. And then we may be among those who are wondering, where is that next meal coming from? If we're trusting in those savings account, the nest egg, the contingency plan, we basically pray to God, you know what? I'm cool. I got this one taken care of. Thank you very much. And again, ask Job, what can happen to security, to nest eggs, to contingency plans? But you practice this one enough, and you can start to see how God's track record works when it comes to give us this day our daily bread. How he is faithful, just as Bev was talking about. Maybe leaving you a penny here, a nickel there. You ever come across another $20 bill? Uh, hang on to that one. But when we see that track record, it gives us a fuller picture of this God that we're praying all these lines to, all these desires to. Let's see how it plays out for the Israelites. And here's where we come to the scripture that I wasn't going to expect you to memorize half of. It comes from Exodus 16, verses, I'm going to actually read 9 through 18. Then Moses said to Aaron, Say to the whole congregation of the Israelites, Draw near to the Lord, for he has heard your complaining. And as Aaron spoke to the whole congregation of the Israelites, they looked towards the wilderness, and the glory of the Lord appeared in the cloud. The Lord spoke to Moses and said, I have heard the complaining of the Israelites. Say to them, At twilight you shall, you shall eat meat, and in the morning you shall have your fill of bread, and then you will know that I am the Lord your God. In the evening, quails came up and covered the camp, and in the morning there was a layer of dew around the camp. When the layer of dew lifted, there on the surface of the wilderness was a fine, flaky substance, as fine as frost on the ground. When the Israelites saw it, they said to one another, What is it? For they did not know what it was. Moses said to them, It is the bread that the Lord has given you to eat. This is what the Lord has commanded. Gather as much of it as, you, as each of you needs, and omer to a person according to a number of persons, all providing for those in their own tents. The Israelites did so, some gathering more, some gathering less. But when they measured it with an omer, those who gathered much had nothing left over, and those who gathered little had no shortage. They gathered as much as each of them needed. This is the word of our Lord. Thanks be to God. Do the Israelites ask, request boldly from God? Absolutely. At least they certainly get the boldness part right. And God does provide for them out of grace. In a desert, in the wilderness, that they weren't just going to grow their own bread on their own. He certainly didn't provide out of their merits as the whole thing comes about because they're going before Moses and Aaron who are kind of leading this whole escapade across the wilderness. And they're saying, you know what? 
When we were in Egypt, at least we had pots of meat for whenever we were hungry. We could eat until we were full. And now you brought us out here, out of Egypt, yeah, great, and now we just get to starve to death. Thanks, Moses. Thanks, Aaron. When they definitely can't do it on their own, certainly don't deserve it out of their gracious attitudes for what Moses is doing for them, God provides. What does he provide? He provides them survival food. Perhaps not the delicacies of prime rib that they may have had in, uh, in Egypt, but enough to survive, to keep them going. How much did God give them? Enough to last a day. Or two, depending on the days, because Sunday was kind of God's rest. And so gather up enough for two days. But those who would try and gather more and stockpile and get their nest egg going, after a day it rotted. You didn't want it around. All of it, right in line with today's stanza. Here's the cool thing. It's not a drastic shift from the stanzas, the lines we've been looking at before. It's not the, let's praise God and worship God and think about the kingdom and everything like that, and then, now let's shift magically to our needs and our desires and give us, give us, give us. But after the worship stanzas, we go right into our daily bread, realizing God is the one who provides it. That he is the provider of all good things, of the manna, of the pennies, of the ability to work, of the healthiness to be able to grow food, have a job, provide. When we pray, Give us this day our daily bread. We acknowledge he is the only one who can answer that request. And we get to see that God really is Jehovah Jireh. God who provides. Nabah, the one who provided for all his people for all time. Amen. Amen.